Hello everyone. So quick update. Um, I know in my last video on this channel I talked about my second channel and how I kind of wanted to reserve the more high quality edited stuff, scripted, um, paced, like just proper videos on this channel where I have the more off the cuff, unedited, just raw footage type of topics on the second channel. Uh, just looking at kind of the upload schedules for each, you can pretty easily tell that I just don't like editing. Um, yeah, it, I've had a video on in the editing bay for quite a while now, and just getting footage and putting it together is just such a pain. And I much prefer kind of just off-the-cuff style, so I think I'm just going to go ahead and start doing that on the main channel. Um, no reason to kind of split things up between the two. Uh, so yeah, expect some of that in the future. There will of course be some actual scripted stuff uh, being released. I would still like to do that, uh, but it'll just be interspersed with kind of the regular stuff I've been doing on the second channel. So uh, yeah, just quick update on, on where we are with that. Anyway, the topic for today. Did I have like a cold open? I don't think I did. It's about metagame philosophy. So, oh, I do have a cold open, actually. All right, so imagine the video starts here. So in a lot of ways, TF2 does get compared to Super Smash Bros. Melee, actually, in that they're both grassroots scenes, uh, kind of scorned by the developers of the games. And, yeah, they just have to, you know, do everything on their own, etc. Now, a lot of that does seem like kind of, um, not cope, but just sort of like, hey, am I invited type of energy from TF2 players? Because to be fair, Melee is a gigantic esport, relatively speaking. Uh, whereas TF2, there's like maybe a couple hundred active players at any given time. So uh, we just will never see the kind of success and liftoff that Melee has, which is totally fine. However, one thing... The one place that I think it's really actually accurate to be comparing the two is in looking at the metagame and how it forms. Because, of course, the games, n neither game is being actively developed or even really touched at all from a balancing perspective. So, as far as metagame goes, like rule set, all of that, it is community decisions. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today, is what, what kind of decisions go into place, different philosophies for crafting the metagame that we play. Because, of course, when casual players think of competitive, the, the number one thing that sticks out to people is it seems like a very restrictive rule set, where you're not allowed to play these certain classes or do these certain things and it's a very stale meta game which might be the topic a more focused topic of a different video is how the meta game in my opinion is not stale at all of course you're not going to see like double spy to mid which to be clear the rule set would allow it's just not good is why and people you know play to win so anyway uh for starters let's talk what should we talk about first? Because there's a fair amount of things I could talk about. I think a good place to start would be... Let's talk class restrictions, actually. So, I think a perfect example of making a metagame is restricting each team to one medic. So, as a quick aside, the reason that uh, you're restricted to one demo at a time is kind of obvious. It's already kind of difficult to push in TF2. It's easier to hold at least, so you need some kind of advantage or you need to craft some type of advantage to be able to fully push a point. And you need to do so much more if there's two demos because usually strategies for pressuring points revolves around finding out where their demo is and going the other way because demos are just too good at holding doors. So. And typically a demo can hold kind of like one side of a map or a point. So when there's two, that's just kind of not an issue. Everything can be held with stickies, which is just broken. And yeah, it's, it's kind of impossible. So that's very straightforward. But something like Medic 
is really subtle and kind of creates the entire metagame we play. And that revolves around Ubers and Uber Ad and Dis Ad. So Uber play is sort of a mini game in and of itself and every decision you make in the game at some level either revolves around entirely or takes into account what the state of ubers are so because both medics build at the same rate build their uber charges at uber charges at roughly the same rate you know essentially how close another team is to uber and of course uber being an extremely centralizing mechanic being able to be completely invincible is going to win you fights if you can do that and the other team can't so a lot of positioning revolves around you know playing particularly passively if uh you know the other team has an uber and you don't because of course you don't want to die to that and of course the snowballing effect of if your team dies on disad because the other team used their uber to kill your medic then it's still disad and that kind of game state continues even further except you're losing ground etc so with that in mind knowing that uh, both medics are going to charge at roughly the same time you can count and approximate how much uber the other team has and play around that fact and do different things um, in order to change the state of ubers uh, for instance you know if it's disad, you may want to sack a soldier if another team's trying to push to take advantage of the fact that they're getting through a choke point to try and turn the disad into add by getting a force, right? Stuff like that. Now, I think that's very... I mean, it's just such a centralizing mechanic, and it's very fun to play around because you get to kind of use your information and use your game knowledge and game sense to outplay another team and that's very rewarding it's very fun to do something like that now we imagine let's take multiple medics into account so there's no restriction whatsoever suddenly kind of the entire metagame falls apart because you know so in a previous example where like we can take what's happening on screen right now as an example our team has an uber we're pushing with our uber the other team doesn't have an uber we of course, they have plenty of counterplay in, you know, the defensive off classes, how they play their last, because lasts are difficult to push into. But we outplay them with our Uber and end up winning a round for it. That was strictly a case of one team having Uber and another team not, and then we get to take a push, they get to do a defense. Everyone understands the situation, and it's just a matter of who comes out on top. You know, just metagame. Now, if there's multiple medics, suddenly the idea of add or disad completely dissolves. Because you can force a medic and the other team still has an uber as an asset. And suddenly it just does not matter at all. And it becomes way more difficult to kind of discern what is even going on. Um, and just the entire metagame falls apart as a result. So I think medic being restricted to one is a pretty illustrative example of how actually restricting the format paradoxically creates more gameplay, more metagame, more stuff to work around, because it actually gives something to bite into, right? Um, if there's absolutely no restrictions at all, a lot of the time a game like TF2 kind of just dissolves and just becomes very chaotic and you just can't really tell what's going on anymore. And it's very nice to have something that you can actually dig into. Um, some, some rule sets that create interesting dynamics that allow players to, you know, play to the best of their abilities, counterplay, um, things like that. So I think that's a good example. Now, when it comes to weapon restrictions, things get a little different because whether a weapon gets restricted or not is in some sense a matter of opinion now there are some weapons that just everyone is in agreement on like for instance the wrangler like even casual players hate the wrangler uh the wrangler just makes pushing into last way too difficult just by virtue of the fact that it you know makes a sentry way more tankable and way harder to take down um so it, yeah everyone's like yeah no we don't want to play with that weapon it's just unfun to play with and very unhealthy for the metagame however for other unlocks for instance the quickie bomb launcher 
or let's imagine what's another one that's uh you know people want to unban the mangler a lot which is interesting anyway uh with examples like that it's more nebulous and there's generally two camps as far as weapon bans go there are the players that think that unless a weapon is broken then you shouldn't be banning it so it needs to be very disruptive for it to be worth banning and in this was a much more common camp to have many many years ago when there was at least some feedback from valve and players had the the opinion that if we could somehow test these weapons get them tweaked a bit uh, so that they're actually allowed for competitive play then you know we might actually see some support from valve in our in our game right which at this point in time is very obviously not the case so um there's absolutely no hope of that being uh, a reality it's more so like people are still you know attached to the idea that if it's not really broken then you know it's fine you can just learn to play around it now that's one camp the other camp is more more hardline purists in the sense that they think a, a weapon has to add value for it to be worth including. So there are some examples, like one being the lock and load, right? Where, and that's actually going to be the topic of uh, another video, which this is intended to be the primer for, actually. But kind of just of the opinion that, yeah, like you can have these weapons, but... If they aren't really adding anything positive to the metagame, then what's the point of even including them? If they're kind of just dumb, but like not so good that it's, you know, super disruptive. Like, why should we just play with stuff that's just kind of dumb for no other reason than to say that we allow more weapons? Which I can, you know, in some respects understand. But it does, you know, trend more towards just banning stuff just because they kind of don't like it. And also sometimes they just don't learn the counterplay that well to certain unlocks or whatever and just kind of want to ban because they think it's stupid. Um, but yeah, uh, one thing I did want to mention as well with regards to like the valve support tweaking weapons. A lot of weapons did actually get kind of adjusted in this way and ended up just being really bad. And there's no possible way that every unlock could be made competitively allowed, I'll say, in the sense that they just aren't completely broken. Like, there are weapons that are just fundamentally broken in a competitive setting that are totally fine in a casual setting. Some examples would include the Mad Milk, Jurati. Things like this will never, ever be acceptable or not broken in a competitive setting, but they're totally fine and casual. So... I think that like a, a, just restricting weapons is probably the smart way to go because, I mean, obviously, you know, players don't want um, weapons that they enjoy using in a more casual setting to be completely gutted and overhauled into something just entirely different for the sake of, you know, some niche competitive game. That's all, of course, a uh, <laughs> strictly theoretical because, of course, nothing is ever going to get changed in this game ever again. Um, and that's chill. <laughs> So, yeah, those are kind of the two camps as far as weapon restrictions go. Now, when you get further into things, a lot more opinion comes out. Because, of course, no one's arguing that, you know, Jurati is, you know, kind of broken. No one's arguing that Mad Milk is broken. No one's arguing that the Wrangler is broken. But there are definitely some things that are common and competitive that are kind of just a matter of opinion. And namely those being the map choice and specifically the game mode choice uh sixes is played entirely on 5 cp and koth and while i think those game modes really really shine in sixes and even the even the major downsides people claim about the formats i think are not really that bad and especially like if you're willing to take more risks and be more aggressive then they seem much less bad um but why not something like payload payload race attack defend things like that and honestly that is mostly just player preference um 
Now, of course, the, the current map pool of payload and, you know, etc. None of those are built for 6v6. They are just way too big for that. But you could theoretically make, like, a smaller payload map catered to a 6v6. I just don't think people would really play it or enjoy it. Because a lot of the 6s metagame is developed around mostly 5cp as well as Koth. So those are just what the game modes people like playing, what they're used to playing. And it's probably going to continue to be like that because, you know, new players are, are learning this format. They get used to it. And, yeah, that's just kind of largely a thing of opinion or just preference. But it's just kind of the, the way it is right now. Anything else I wanted to talk about? Um, this ended up being a little less clear and focused than I intended. But... Still, just trying to drive the point that uh, this is a crafted metagame. I think that making decisions to make the metagame better is not a bad thing. I think that leaving the game more of a standard version, or like a stock version, uh, basically trying to align competitive to be as easy to get into for a new player by uh, as possible, is not really a good way to go. I think you should be crafting your rule set to be as competitive and fun as possible. I think that's a good way to go. And whether people play or not is going to be strictly up to whether they want to or not. But you're going to get more people playing if your game is actually fun. Um, so, yeah. What was it? And there's other things as well. Like, I mean, no one's going to argue that, you know, random crits or random weapon spread should be enabled in in a competitive format, stuff like that. So I, crafting a rule set to be as fun and fair as possible is a good goal to have. I understand that there are gonna be people who are just spy mains and they just wanna play spy and they get told that spy is bad in sixes. And you could just play a full-time spy in sixes if you wanted. It's not like against the rules, it's just people won't generally want to play against that and you're gonna generally be less effective than a scout would be, for instance. Um, and I understand that's that's a big holdup for people, and they might just not want to play competitive as a result of that. And honestly, that's fine, because no one should have to play uh, one game mode, one format, one thing, or another. I think this Sixes is very fun, and I think that uh, the rule set's been crafted in such a way to keep it that way. Um, and yeah, that's just a matter of opinion, I suppose. Anyway, I think I'm rambling a bit here, but uh, yeah. This is a primer for another video I'll probably still release today, so keep your eyes peeled for that, and just keep in mind that, you know, crafting a metagame, it is not just, there is no God-given rule set to play this game, and no, you know, intended way to play this game. Everyone plays with some config or other to tweak the game, or at least have decisions about how the game is played. So, yeah, competitive is, uh, is no exception. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed um, hope the new format isn't going to be too much of a shocker, but uh, you're going to get a lot more content out of me when I do things this way. So anyway, thank you guys for watching and see you next time.